Tonight it was my pleasure to interview Jason Loftus, the director for Eternal Spring, a film about Falun Gong and bravery. This is Jesus Solomon Olivares of the Hollywood Times, or Sully for short. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. I define bravery as doing what is what you feel is right and dealing with the consequences later. This was one of the most harrowing examples of bravery that I have ever seen put to film. How long did it take to plan and scope out the areas they wanted to use for the broadcasting? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. They they started thinking that they might be able to just tap into one area and then they recognized that really the um the main line from the tv was at the tv station directly and it and it split into into kind of two very close so they realized they were going to have to if they wanted to reach the city they and not just choose half of it they were going to have to find two locations and work in concert so that seemed to be um, sort of one key day, the way it was described by the witnesses. Now, there might have been others who were involved that we didn't get to speak with who had been kind of, you know, looking around for more. But uh, for us, it was when the people we spoke with, they were part of, Mr. White was part of sort of a one-day scouting effort. And it was something they had to be careful about because even looking around the city and like kind of surveilling the <laughs> the TV wires would raise questions if you were doing too much of that. So um, they had to be discreet when they were doing it. That makes a lot of sense. I love the animation retelling of the story. Thank you. It's so beautiful. I can't stop gushing over it. How long did it take to draw and animate? Yeah, so we were a small team. So this project stretched out um, between five and six years for us. And uh, part of that was we were doing something unique in terms of combining the live action with the animation. And we wanted to be sort of capturing Dashong and shooting him as he was going through this artistic process. And so there's like the regular documentary pro aspect of it, as well as the animated pro like aspect of it. So that took some time, but also we have a very small team. If you look at the credits in the animation, there's four animators, including the animation director on this project. And for a feature film in animation, that's sort of unprecedentedly small. There's one man who who did the lighting and rendering for the entire film, which is probably a record for, for a feature animation. So because of that, I think it, it we stretched it out with a sort of small and dedicated team over a period of time. But I think it was also helpful to have that. Of course, we were working on other projects from time to time as well. This is something we were just chipping away at, um, but we had this sort of shared vision and this passion to do something unique with it. And I think having that extra time allowed us to figure out how we were going to do this, which is always something that takes a little bit of time when you're doing something unique that you haven't seen done before. Yeah. Okay, so living in the U.S. and having a disability along with having a smooth talking way about me, I was I never feared police brutality. What do you hope? This was an eye opener for me. What do you mm. hope that this film does for people? Thank you. Um, yeah, I I do hope it shines a light on on the situation with human rights in China. You know, specifically for the Falun Gong community, of course, because they're the ones depicted in the film and. And this persecution continues for them and they have not, there hasn't been a lot of attention around it because it's been going on for some time. And we tend to all kind of move to the next subject when something, you know, there's some new tragedy in the world, we move on and we might think that things have gotten better when they haven't necessarily changed. So I do hope that the film can shine a light on the ongoing persecution of Falun Gong. There's also this, uh, it's not only Falun Gong. Uh, I mean, if we look in the Northwest of China, there are others like the Uyghur Muslim community who've been subjected to similar uh, tactics in terms of, you know, being held in internment camps and coerced and compelled to abandon their beliefs and traditions and such. So there's other groups that are affected by the same treatment. And we do hope that the film shines a light on it. 
But I think more broadly than China and more broadly than the human rights uh, angle, I think it's some of the things that you touched on when we just started speaking about this example of bravery. This is something that really touched me um, through making this film was this idea that, you know, we all face it in some regard. Like we see something that isn't right or we see some kind of injustice and it might not be convenient to say something about it. We see something that doesn't say right, but maybe for various reasons, um, you know, we don't speak up. Now, this is a very extreme case. These people in terms of speaking up, um, they could lose their lives or they could be in danger. They could lose their livelihoods, all of this. Most of us don't face that kind of threat on a day-to-day -day basis. But still, it's a very human experience to sort of see something that isn't right and, and to ask, you know, do I have the courage to speak up and how to go about that? And so I think in this extreme case where they pulled off this really remarkable uh, action, that it's something that we can all sort of take some inspiration from and, and uh, gives us something to, to pause and think about. And I think that that's a good thing for all of us, even if we aren't already uh, particularly interested in the human rights situation in China, we can still take some inspiration from their story. What was the idea with the balloons? Mm. So um, initially, I think that they were trying to uh, sort of get their message in a way that the authorities wouldn't be able to easily catch them or find out who was responsible for it. So you would, you know, you'd, you'd hang a banner on some, uh, on, you know, you'd hang a banner from some balloons and, and then you, you put some like maybe fishing line and so the, the cops can't see exactly what's holding it in place, but it's, it's floating up there in a, in a place where a lot of people could see it. And this was some of the creativity that they had. You know, they knew that the authorities were going to arrest them for basically any efforts to try and, and say anything and speak out. So they would find these creative ways to sort of give themselves a little bit more time and leeway to do it. And then I had heard this story where they would send up flyers as part of the package. And, you know, when they were when they were sending these balloons up and I just thought, oh, that's really clever because then basically, you know, if the balloons pop or fall or whatever it is, then there's flyers that are going to be, they're kind of like, it, it, it shows you this kind of like the cat and mouse game that they were playing with the authorities in the sense that the authorities were always trying to stop what they were doing and they were using their creativity and, and you know, and, and ingenuity to try and find a solution to get the word out. And, I, and that really resonated with me. And I think it speaks to the kind of mindset of the, of the people who were behind the TV hijacking. You know, we heard that Liang was behind this balloon initiative and you can just sort of capture, I felt it captured his spirit to a certain extent. You know, this kind of like, he, he felt things were wrong and he was going to, you know, creatively, uh, he was going to persist and he was going to creatively find some way to, to sort of outdo all the authorities and, and get his message out. There was a mythical creature in the beginning of the story. I don't think I'm pronouncing him right, right but it, his name is Shang Fei. We, uh, UFA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. What? Who was he? Or why was he considered a mythical creature in China? Yeah. So he was. Uh... He's a, he was a real life historical figure, um, but he's also become a, a bit of a legend in Chinese history um, because he had this sort of outstanding example through his life story of loyalty to the country, despite all kinds of, you know, risks and such. And, and, uh, and, and so it, Chinese people all sort of all know his story and and it resonates with them. He ended up dying, unfortunately, and, and those who he was loyal to didn't necessarily appreciate his loyalty fully. Um, but I think probably what he suffered and, and sacrificed and through all of that still demonstrated his allegiance to, to China, to his country, to all of this is something that really shines through and, and Chinese people remember it. And so I felt it was interesting because you know, Dashong talks about how it wasn't the superheroes that he got to draw later, which made him famous. That's not what originally got him interested in comics. You know, comics were for him these stories that he would read at the kind of it was basically like um like a library or like a, a book rental place where you could rent these comics, these Chinese comics, and they were full of these historical figures, these legends, right? Of these great figures who they weren't they didn't have superpowers and all of this necessarily they were they were examples because of their amazing bravery or loyalty or courage or different different aspects of their you know the sort of cultural um you know values that chinese people hold dear that were reflected through their personal life stories and that's what actually had inspired dashong to begin illustrating and i thought that was very interesting 
um, because it's unique. It's not what we think about when we think about comics. We think about, you know, uh, you know, made up figures. We made made up superheroes with all kinds of powers that none of us have. We don't think about real life uh, heroes. And so perhaps for Dashong, that's part of his passion in wanting to draw real life figures. He's mentioned that now. And I think through this process of drawing the story of the TV hijackers, he has come to look at these individuals also as real life heroes. And he started to speak about them in the way that he was speaking about UFA and those who had inspired uh, him to get into art in the first place. And so I feel that now he feels, uh, you know, because sometimes when you survive a difficult event, so maybe, you know, you're tortured, but you get to live and other people don't live. Some people, you know, other people are killed, as we see in this film. It's very understandable to have some kind of survivor's guilt, this feeling of like, well, how come I survived or how come those people suffered? Is there anything I could have done? This kind of thing. And I feel for Dashong now, I see him channeling some of that through his artwork. He feels like, OK, you know what? I'm still here, but I have this artistic ability. And they're, they are gone, but I can carry on their story through my pen and I can help more people to know about their amazing values and have them be examples for the future, just as UFA was an example for me. Yeah. For people who don't know what is Falun Gong, because you can do, in, you, you can easily do a Google search, yes, but I want to hear from people who were all right, working with actual participants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, thank you for that. I think it's important because, um, you know, the story itself is about a group of people who wanted to be understood, obviously because the, the misunderstandings and misinformation were, were fueling a persecution campaign against them, but they wanted to to clarify what they're about. And I think it is important to to give them that voice and to be able to to listen to people and to hear what they have to say, especially when they're being treated unfairly. And um, and so that's one of the reasons in the film where I felt it was important not to have this sort of like external conversation, like what do people who are outside of the Falun Gong community have to say and how would they summarize what Falun Gong is, but to really just allow people to be situated within the group and the community and to hear how they discuss amongst each other. I really enjoyed the fact that there were differences of opinion about whether this was a good idea. Some people felt it was against Falun Gong's beliefs and some people felt it was a good idea. And, and just seeing these differences of opinions allows you to get a sense of the dynamics in the group and what, and what their values are and what their beliefs are. So um, I originally came across Falun Gong myself before there was a crackdown in China. When I was in high school, I had an interest in Eastern philosophy and meditation, and I had explored different things, and I came across Falun Gong. And a year after I had encountered Falun Gong, the Chinese government banned it and started saying these people are evil and dangerous. And I knew very little about Chinese politics, but what I did know is that what I was hearing from the state media reports didn't reconcile with my own experiences with Falun Gong or my encounters with the people uh, who, who were practicing it. And so for me, that planted this seed of concern for the human rights situation, but also I think a, a sense that I wanted people to sort of hear these people for themselves, right? And allow them to have that, to have that voice. So, I mean, at a basic level, Falun Gong is, is a, a meditation practice or, you know, some kind of, it has slow moving exercises and then it has these moral teachings and you can see them in the one scene where they're, they're sort of studying the teachings of Falun Gong and, and it's centered around these values of truthfulness, compassion and forbearance. So it has a kind of philosophical or spiritual component to it. And at the same time, then it has these sort of meditative exercises where it's a, sort of like energy moving exercises and a meditation. That's the idea behind it all is that um, your the elevation of your moral character is is intertwined with your kind of physical improvement, and so the movements are not purely physical exercises. It also matters, you know, the state of your mind and how you're thinking and your ability to give up sort of selfish desires and these kinds of things. And as you start to um, improve your moral character in line with these principles of truthfulness, compassion, forbearance then you're doing the exercises and your energy will be strengthened through that. That's the, you know, that's how I would describe my, my understanding of it. Um, and I think it's a positive thing. And so I wanted people to be able to, 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 you know, hear from the group and, and sort of interact with them more personally and directly. Can you go into some detail of 
what 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 teachings they are for Falun Gong? Uh, Basic. yeah. So there's, so, sorry, I interrupted. Basic teachings. Yeah, the fundamentals are based around these three values, and in Chinese, it's Zhen Shan Ren, and it, and that's basically truthfulness or truth, uh, compassion or kindness, goodness, right? And the third one is Ren is like uh, tolerance, endurance, the ability to forbear. So these are kind of the three essentials uh, that everything else is built upon, and then they're sort of you know, lectures or teachings about how those are applied in day-to-day -day life. That's the basic idea. Oh, that's cool. Really cool. Was, with the broadcasting hijacking, was the broadcasting hijacking, hijacking be more difficult today? That's or a great question. Would it be more easier because, because of the technological advances? Yeah, that's a good question. So we were doing a panel at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival in New York in May, and we had some experts from Human Rights Watch who were closely monitoring the situation in China and the ongoing sort of human rights concerns. And they mentioned how difficult it would be to do today, unfortunately. Um, you know, one thing that I've noted is that in the aftermath of this event, I believe the authorities made efforts to sort of update the television infrastructure to make it more difficult and less vulnerable uh, to, to these kinds of like, uh, you know, hacking efforts. But beyond that, the, the Chinese state has invested so much in sort of surveillance technology and, and all of these things, facial recognition, like every tool under the sun to sort of keep tabs on where all the people are and what they're doing. And so assembling and doing these kinds of things is a lot more difficult. I'll give you an example that was brought up on the panel with Human Rights Watch. You know, there's a, um, a rights defending lawyer in China who was going to help uh, you know, a, a rights defender uh, who needed representation because he was running into troubles with the Chinese state. But the lawyer found that when he went to go visit his client, all of a sudden his, um, his COVID app, in, in the, now they have these cell phone things where you need a QR code in China to go anywhere. And they've integrated this with like, it's a health pass and you need to be tested. And, and you know, if, you're, if you test positive, you're basically, you can't do anything, can't go anywhere. And so this person had not tested positive, but all of a sudden his um, his app was saying so, and he was forbidden from taking transit or going to see his clients and these kinds of things. So the state has set up all of these digital aspects uh, and sometimes they do so in the name of public security, but what is really given the tool, the, 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 the party or the authorities is this has so many tools with which to control and monitor and track and, and repress people. So it's very, very difficult for something exactly like this to be repeated, I would say. In, right after this happened though, there were other efforts in other cities. Some of them were successful. We don't get into that in the film, but this did inspire other efforts. And I think despite the difficulties and challenges today, the spirit of what these people had done still lives on because there are still many efforts within China to sort of get the word out. And there are people, for example, who have technology tools that will help people to get through the internet firewall so that within China, they can access free information outside of China. So there is this kind of, um, you know, cooperation or, or, you know, amongst people who, you know, maybe they're not hijacking the television anymore, but they're doing other things to try and break through this censorship and misinformation just in a new form. What is the Chinese government's obsession with Falun Gong? It's a good question. I think uh, initially the Communist Party took power in 1949. There, there was already, um, you know, in opposition to any kind of religion and, or religious belief because it is an officially atheist regime and, and uh, ideology. Uh, so that's, I mean, if you see communist regimes in other countries, there has frequently been religious persecution associated with, with their rules as well. So that's not uncommon. But I think there was a particular issue in China, in part perhaps because of legitimacy. So if you look at the Communist Party, this is a Western ideology, communism. It comes from Marx. It's a, it comes from the West. And so when it comes into China, there's this sort of ideological threat because it isn't something that's native to China. It's not traditional Chinese uh, you know, thinking. And so 
I think perhaps because of that, they were particularly harsh to anything that was perhaps more rooted in in you know Chinese and and I think Falun Gong it's it's a you know it's from a Buddhist tradition. It's something that I think a lot of Chinese people can resonate with the ideas in it, uh, and it it may be familiar in that regard. You know, and it kind of, and it was introduced in China as well. So I think there's this. I think the other aspect of it as well is we do see religious persecution of other groups in China. So the Uyghur Muslims have been in the news. That's a very large scale uh, repression that's happening. Um, the Tibetans have been in the news over time. But what you find with some of these groups uh, in the House Christians as well, uh, what you find with these groups is that the party is at sometimes more easily able to portray them as an us versus them struggle. And what I mean by that is, well, you know, when it comes to Christianity, this is like these are foreign hostile forces who are trying to, you know, get their way into China because it comes from Westerners or, or whatever, right? When it comes to Tibet, it's like these are separatists who are trying to, uh, you know, take like take part of China. And when it comes to the Uyghurs in the northwest of China, they portray them as terrorists, right? And so they have these kind of labels that for the, the, the majority of people in China, they're told, okay, these people are not you. These are against us. They're trying to do something against us. And they can create this kind of us versus them um, schism. The difference with Falun Gong is that it was widely practiced by the majority Han Chinese. It was practiced by people all over the place, right? At every level of society. And I think that probably made the Communist Party even more nervous because there were people within the Communist Party, within the military, probably leaders, family members who were practicing or who had practiced. And so if they were concerned about any ideology that they didn't have control over, um, this maybe made them even more anxious. Yeah. Will it ever be in English stuff? I don't think we'll do a dub. Uh, I think we will stick with the subtitles. Uh, we do have a uh, we do have described video version that we uh, we made together with uh, Human Rights Watch, which gave us support for for accessibility, which is great. And then we have you know closed caption versions and such as well for accessibility. But in terms of you know uh, from a, like a from a stylistic standpoint, I think there's something with a documentary in particular. I know that a lot of times U.S. audiences prefer to hear things in English, but I feel like for a documentary, it's really valuable to um, to hear people in their own voice, even if we don't necessarily understand the words that they're saying. You know, where we have to at that point, you know, we're reading it, but it is um, it is something where when we're when we're hearing their voice, we can we can get another sense. We can we sort of tell, the pain, right? Yeah, you can feel the pain that they've gone through. You can get the the feel, and and you know, there's always a separation if you put a, a you know a dubbing artist in between that. Yeah, I I understand. What about a live action Hollywood remake of it? <laughs> we'll see what the future holds we'll see what the future holds at this point i'm hoping hollywood hollywood resonates with the the version that we've got um because we're making a run there uh in our campaigns in in different categories right now for the oscars and that's where our focus is at this point but we'll see what the future holds okay i defined bravery earlier in my own words but to end this interview i want to Keep your perspective on what it means to be brave. I think you had a pretty good definition of it. You know, I think most times we know in our conscience that something is right or wrong, right? And uh, bravery is really, you know, doing what's the right thing regardless of, of what consequences that you might face. I don't think it means necessarily ignoring them. Uh, you know, you want to obviously be responsible to, to yourself and people around you in terms of mitigating consequences. But it's important that we speak up because so often the way that totalitarian regimes work and they're able to achieve what they achieve is because so many people make that calculation. Oh, it's, it's, it's difficult to speak up, right? And many, many people know um, that something's not right and they don't say anything about it. And the society really starts to change. You know, Dashong made an interesting comment um, when we were doing a Q&A with an art school, a university here focused on the arts in Canada, and he just talked about how when he was learning art, 
the most important thing for him to be able to do was to draw a perfect image of Mao. And what that meant was it had to look like Mao, but Mao also had to look glorious. These were the requirements for him to demonstrate his ability as an artist. And he said, if I was being totally honest, what I, if I was to draw what I thought of Mao, they would probably kill me, right? You know? And he said, the thing was then, even at a young age, I was being taught to lie through my art. And you know, nowadays, many of us have that same question. And sometimes it might be lying somewhat for money or for whatnot, because you know, we're putting on a face and we're saying, okay, this product is great or this thing is wonderful. And we might not really mean it. And, and I think his point was really, it's, it's so, so important to be able to, to speak the truth and to find yourself through art and be able to, to speak the truth as an artist is very, very valuable. And I think it's valuable for a society. If we look what happened in, you know, at the early stages of the COVID pandemic in China, there was a doctor there, uh, Li Wenliang, who noticed that there was some virus that was spreading, and he just tried to inform a couple of his colleagues. He wasn't trying to sound the alarm and be a hero to everybody, and still the authorities found what, what he was communicating through his social media app, and they summoned him, and they punished him. And in the meantime, the virus was still spreading. And I think this for me, I mean, who knows what, what impact that has on, on the initial spreading of the whole pandemic and everything. Uh, I, I don't think we can, we can determine, but my, my point is just that it really hit me how important it is to have a society where people can speak the truth. If you can't, then uh, there's so many consequences that can come from that, whether that's massive human rights abuses, uh, or, or things like, you know, like what we've experienced with the pandemic as well. It's like, we need to be able to have transparency to, to be able to get to the bottom of things. And so that requires some courage. And it's not just one person that has to be courageous. It's many people who have to be willing to, to speak up um, without necessarily, even if they might face reprisals or some kind of consequence from it, it's, it's still very, very important. Are there anywhere we can follow you on? Instagram. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm on Instagram, but I've only done ever like five posts in my life. I do a little bit more on Facebook. Uh, the studio is at lofty sky docs where we talk about the film and that's on every social media platform. So people can find us there. Um, you know, if you Google me, Jason Loftus, you can find my channels, but I'm a lot less active. Uh, I do, I enjoy most, uh, what we're doing right now, which is having that you know, that opportunity for a real human to human conversation. So I'm continuing to do a lot of Q and A's with the film and uh, encourage people to check out the website actually, if they'd like to reach us because that shows where the film will be. And, you know, we're, we're all be uh, doing the Q and A's as well, wherever I can. And so check us out at eternalspringfilm.com. Okay. All right. We thank will. you, Salia. Thank you, you too. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you for your time and concentration with me because I am a, sometimes a pain in the butt, but it's okay. <laughs> it's more than okay. You were great. Thank you. Have a good day.